So we now reach the point where we're going to go over the five pillars of Islam. And the five pillars of Islam are the five most important external actions in Islam. The first pillar is the two testimonies of faith, known as the Shahadatayn, to testify that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah, as explained in the previous section. This does have to be done aloud, although you don't need any witnesses for it. And this first pillar isn't just equal. It's not like pillar one is the same as pillar two is the same as pillar three, but this pillar is more important than all of the other pillars. And all of the other pillars are built upon this pillar, the two testimonies of faith, as we had explained in the previous section. The second pillar in Islam is the prayer, known in Arabic as the Salah. This refers to the five obligatory daily prayers, the explanation of which will come later in the course, inshallah. The third pillar is the zakah, zakah. And this is a kind of obligatory charity that you spend from your excess wealth. So it's uh, not something you have an option to give or not to give. And it's not something you pay on all of your wealth. It's something you pay on certain specific types of excess wealth, extra wealth that you have. Uh, when it reaches a particular threshold, and this threshold in Arabic is called the nisab, when it reaches a particular threshold or a particular amount, then it is payable. So what is zakah payable upon? It's payable upon savings of gold and silver, including jewelry and money. It's also due upon certain crops and fruits, as well as commercial assets, trade goods, and business profits. Each category of wealth has its own rules, threshold, percentage due, and so on. Zakah is not due on the necessities of life, like food, drink, clothing, the house you live in, and the car you drive, even if it's a luxurious house or a luxurious car. Zakah is distributed to the most needy people in society, but there are strict rules about who can and can't receive it. So it's worth asking your teacher to help you to calculate what you need to pay and who you need to pay it to. In some countries, the government collects and distributes zakah, and in others, it's the responsibility of the individual Muslim to do so. It's very important that you're careful to distribute zakah to the right people, and there are trustworthy, charitable organizations that can help you to do that. The Prophet وسلم, sent one of his companions, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, to Yemen to call the people to Islam and to teach them the basics of the religion. He said to this companion, Mu'adh, in the translation of which is, you're going to a people from the people of the book. So call them to testify that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and that I am the messenger of Allah. If they obey you in that, then inform them that Allah has made five prayers obligatory in each day and night. If they obey you in that, then inform them that Allah has made a charity, meaning the zakah, obligatory for them, that is taken from their rich and given to their poor. So it's not taken from the rich and given to the government, so to speak, or taken from the rich and given to other people who are rich. Rather, it's taken from the rich and given to the poor. Let me give you an example of the zakah. And, and it's not the purpose in this course to teach you everything about the zakah, but let's just give an example. So zakah is due on gold once the total gold that you own, including the gold that you have in jewelry, not including the gems or gemstones or silver, but the gold you have in jewelry, reaches 85 grams, approximately. So when you have gold that reaches 85 grams, and you have that with you for one complete Islamic Hijri year. The Hijri year is the year of the Islamic months, not the year of the Gregorian calendar. Zakah is due at a rate of 2.5%. And the same applies to silver, but the threshold for silver is 595 grams. So let's just say, for example, I happen to own 40 grams of gold. Tomorrow, I buy another 40 grams of gold. The next day, I buy another 10 grams of gold. Now I have 90. Now I've gone over the 85. I've gone over the threshold. Okay, so now I start counting. When a whole Islamic year goes by, 
I pay two and a half percent of that 90 grams that I had from that day. And the same would be the case for silver, but silver would be a higher amount of grams. It's 595 grams. So what about money? Well, as for money, it should be compared to whichever is lower in value. 85 grams of gold or 595 grams of silver. Right now, silver is a lot cheaper than gold, so it would be the silver that is used. So for example, we just give you an example. If 595 grams of silver is $300, then this becomes a threshold for currency. And don't worry if it takes time to get used to calculating the zakah, you can always ask your teacher for help. And it's something that I would say many Muslims uh, would also often struggle with or would also need a little help with. Even those who were born Muslim and brought up paying zakah since, you know, as long as they can remember, they still need a little help from time to time. So don't worry if you have to ask your teacher. The main, the real main thing is that if you think you have this category of wealth, like you have a, a reasonable amount of gold, more than 85 grams, or more than 595 grams of silver, or more than a few hundred dollars in savings, for example, then you are very likely to need to pay zakah. So in that case, you should speak with your teacher and maybe even attend a workshop specific to the zakah that would help you from there. So benefits of the zakah include giving a very small amount of the extra wealth that you have to those who don't have enough and improving the society as a whole, building a bond of brotherhood between rich people and poor people. Purifying your wealth from the elements of forbidden earning and spending that creep in despite your best efforts. Increasing our wealth because charity makes you rich, both in a spiritual sense and in a practical sense since Allah promises to give you more money when you give in charity. So charity makes you rich no matter what you do. The fourth pillar from the five pillars of Islam is fasting Ramadan. Fasting is known as Sawm in Arabic with that S and a dot underneath, Saad, Sawm. The month of Ramadan, as we said, it, it shouldn't be pronounced Ramadan. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar. And fasting means refraining from food, drink, intimate relations, and other things that break the fast, like taking medicine, from the time of the first call to prayer at true dawn until the time of the fourth call to prayer just after sunset. So it's not fasting daylight hours because uh, true dawn happens before daylight. So it's, it's a bit longer than daylight hours. But it's from the first prayer until the fourth prayer. From Fajr until Maghrib. First prayer until fourth prayer, which is true dawn until sunset. Allah told us about fasting in the Quran. Uh, for example, Allah said, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O you who believe, fasting has been decreed for you as it was decreed for those before you, so that you may protect yourselves from punishment. There are some times when a person is excused from fasting. This includes when traveling, and sickness which is serious enough to make fasting harmful or difficult. Pregnancy and breastfeeding are also considered to be an excuse if the woman feels that it would be hard for her to fast. Women who are menstruating are not allowed to fast. There's no choice there. If she starts her menses, she's not allowed to fast. In all of these cases, fasting days are made up later. So the traveling person, when they come back from traveling, the sick person, when they feel better, the pregnant lady, when she after she's given birth the, and finished the... Uh, postnatal feeding, uh, breastfeeding when she's finished feeding the child, weaned the child, um, the lady on her menses or postnatal bleeding uh, when that has finished. Every one of those groups makes up the fasting days later. Some people have long-term medical conditions which stop them from fasting on a permanent basis. Uh, I give an example, type 1 diabetes, for example. It's a long-term medical condition and it stops people from fasting on a permanent basis. These people don't have to make up the fast because obviously it's not expected that they ever will be able to make up the fast. But they do have to pay to feed a poor person for every day of fasting that they missed. When nearing the month of Ramadan, do make sure you attend a special class or workshop so that you're prepared. Because 
all we've done here is just to go over a very brief overview of the rules on fasting. We haven't really gone into a huge amount of detail, so it's worth going to a unique, a special workshop when you get nearer to the month of Ramadan. There are also voluntary fasts that a Muslim can perform throughout the year, like fasting on a Monday, Thursday, the 13th, 14th, and 15th of, an, of the Islamic month, the 10th day of Muharram called Ashura, the month of Muharram, uh, the day of Arafah, which is the ninth day of the Islamic month, Dhul Hijjah, as well as the days of the month before it, six days from the month of Shawwal, and so on. There are lots of voluntary options for fasting. There is also another kind of zakah, and this zakah is called zakatul fitr. It's not the same as the normal zakah, which is why I'm mentioning it here, because it, it's payable at the end of the month of Ramadan, one or two days before the month ends. A Muslim must pay it for himself and all the people he is legally bound to support, like his wife and children, as long as the person themselves has at least a day's worth of food. And it's even recommended to pay it on behalf of an unborn child. So it's it's not the usual zakah. Remember, the usual zakah is all about threshold. You keep it for a year, usually. You keep it for a year, an Islamic year. Then you pay a certain percentage. Zakat al-fitr is everybody has to pay it who has at least a day's worth of food in the house. I mean, if they, are, if they have enough money to buy at least one day's worth of food, they have to pay zakat al-fitr and it's connected to Ramadan, not really connected to Zakah per se. It's connected to, more connected to the month of Ramadan, which is why I mentioned it in this section here. As for the amount of Zakat or Fitr, it is a Sa'a with a, that, that, notice the two strange letters, the S with the dot underneath, and then that uh, curly apostrophe, which is the Ayn, a Sa'a, which is approximately three liters in volume, and a lot of the scholars just round it to three kilograms in weight. So it would be a sar of the staple food you, of the country you live in, like rice or wheat, whatever, for every single person. And that's really to make sure that the poor people and the people who don't have enough to feed themselves with can also enjoy the celebration at the end of Ramadan, the day of Eid, and that they're not, you know, sort of starving while everyone else is having a luxurious meal so every single person, every single Muslim, and of course the person who is the, the one who spends on the household, pays for everybody, they pay for a sar, which is around about, around about three kilograms. It's not exactly in kilograms, but a lot of people approximate it like that. Three kilograms of, say, rice, wheat, um, whatever the food, that the normal food is in the country. And that goes to the people who are poor and needy. Benefits of fasting. The month of Ramadan include increasing in obedience to Allah by cutting out some worldly desires, very much like a training program. Increasing in gratitude for what we've been given and recognizing the needs of those who are less fortunate than us. A person who fasts during this month, sincerely believing in Allah, in obedience to his commands and is certain of his rewards in the hereafter for doing so, will have all of his past sins forgiven. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man sama Ramadana imana wa ihtisaba ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi. Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan out of sincere faith and in anticipation of Allah's reward will have all of his past sins forgiven. And the fasting person will experience great joy in the hereafter for the rewards they will get and the bliss they will enjoy for fasting. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he told us that Allah said, and the translation of this is, fasting is for me and it's I who give a reward for it. A fasting person has two moments of joy. When he breaks his fast, he is happy. When he meets Allah, he will be happy. By the one whose hand the soul of Muhammad is in, the smell of the breath of a fasting person is better in the sight of Allah than the smell of musk. The fifth pillar is the Hajj. And this is a once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to Mecca for those who are financially and physically able. The Hajj pilgrimage takes place in the month of Dhul Hijjah, which is the 12th month of the Islamic lunar calendar, between the 8th and 13th day. A Muslim has to do it once in a lifetime if they have the money and if they can reach Mecca safely. 
The pilgrimage involves a series of activities taught by the Prophet وسلم, which include, among other things, assuming the condition of ritual purity, which is called ihram. Usually you see people wearing, for example, men, you see them wearing white garments, for example, like two white uh, towels wrapped around them. Walking seven times around the Kaaba, walking seven times between the hills of As-Safa and Al-Marwa, standing on the plain of Arafah, which is nearby in Mecca, and throwing pebbles at the stone pillars in Mina. These are all parts of the activities that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to do in the Hajj. There's also a smaller version of the Hajj which can be performed all year round, but it's not a pillar of Islam. This is called Umrah, and it only takes a couple of hours to perform in the sacred mosque in Mecca. And it has even greater reward when it's performed in the month of Ramadan. Once you know you're going to Hajj or Umrah, it's a good idea to attend a class or workshop specifically on the topic so you know what to do before you go. No doubt this is just a very, very brief summary just to get you acquainted with the pillars of Islam. And it's not the purpose that we would necessarily include everything relating to the Hajj in this brief overview. So from the benefits of the Hajj are uniting the Muslims at a single time of year for the cause of worshipping Allah alone, demonstrating submission to Allah, humility and commitment. And following the example of the prophets, peace be upon them all who made the pilgrimage, including Ibrahim, Abraham, Musa, Moses, Isa, Jesus, and Muhammad, alayhim salatu wassalam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all. Hajj also teaches us the brotherhood of Islam. People gather together regardless of ethnicity, wealth, or social status with men wearing the same simple pieces of cloth. People build lifelong friendships after performing pilgrimage together. Note that when we talked about these five pillars of Islam, did you notice how the pillars move down in order of frequency? What was the first pillar of Islam? The two testimonies of faith. And this is required for you to implement in every second and every breath of your life. You don't have to say it again and again, but you have to implement it that you bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That's something every moment of your life, there's some involvement of that. The prayer is something you do five times every day. Zakah for most people is once or maybe twice a year. Fasting happens once a year for 30 days and Hajj takes place once in a lifetime, although you can do it more if you wish to and if you can afford it. Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him told us that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Bunya al-Islamu ala khams, shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh, wa iqami salah wa ita'i zakah wa hajj al-bayt, wa sawmi ramadan. Islam was built on five pillars. The testimony that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad is a slave and messenger, performing the prayer, giving zakah, Hajj to the sacred house and fasting in the month of Ramadan.